morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the course on uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. We began this uh, looking at the introduction to First Timothy uh, last week. We also read through first the chapter one, and uh, we came up to verse three. We'll continue from there today. So before we begin, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning. We thank you for allowing us Hello, can you hear Christopher? I can't hear Charles, sorry. Charles, we can't hear you. Are others able to hear him? No, ma'am. Okay. Maybe his uh, internet, his connectivity is interrupted. So can somebody else lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Yes, go ahead, Asha. Thank you. Dear God, thank you so much for your loving kindness and your mercy. Lord, as we are about to start our class, Dr. Timothy Titus, I feel in the Lord that you strengthen our minds and help us to grow in wisdom and knowledge and equip us to learn more that we may understand deeper thoughts and deeper things that you have to teach God. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Selena. She teaches, Lord, that you continue to pour your spirit and uh, help us to grow so God in the ways she's about to teach. Thank you so much, Lord, for everything. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Charles, sorry, we couldn't hear you, Charles. So uh, I think maybe your uh, internet connectivity was weak. So I asked uh, uh, Asha to lead us in prayer. Is that okay? Are you there, Charles? He's disconnected, I guess, ma'am. Oh, because I see him anyways. Okay, thank you, Stavani. Um, So last uh, Monday, we began looking at uh, First Timothy. We looked at the background, um, and we got gathered some information about uh, Paul, his missionary journeys. Um, and we saw that, uh, you know, after his release from his first a Roman imp uh, imprisonment, which is somewhere between 63 uh, to 67 AD. Uh, you know, uh, Paul travels along uh, with uh, Titus to Crete, um, you know, and he leaves Titus there uh, to continue the work at Crete. And then uh, Paul, you know, travels along with Timothy to Ephesus. Um, and this time he leaves uh, Timothy, uh, young Timothy um, at uh, uh, Ephesus to oversee the work there. And then Paul uh, travels on to uh, other regions and he goes to Macedonia uh, where he writes, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, this letter to First Timothy and Titus uh, during this time. Uh, uh, you know, and some people say he also wrote Hebrews during this time, uh, but uh, but it's most likely that he wrote it from uh, Macedonia. He just writes uh, First Timothy. He writes Titus, um, uh, who he who he has left at Crete, just encouraging them. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving them the moral support, the encouragement that they need to continue the work because it was not easy for them uh, being young and overseeing these churches, uh, uh, which already was established and had elders there. Um, and the wrong, uh, the false doctrines that were being preached and uh, and taught, uh, and uh, also to uh, you know bring in uh, some uh, some order in the church. Uh, so he writes back to them, talking about all of these things and basically just encouraging uh, both uh, Timothy and uh, uh, Titus. Um, and we see that you know to, during Paul's. Um, 
second Roman imprisonment. Uh, he writes his last episode, which is Second Timothy, uh, and uh, you know we 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 see that uh, Timothy is uh, a son uh, who uh, to Paul, who's uh, Paul mentored, uh, who he um, you know uh, established in the work of the Lord. And Timothy has just matured, has grown uh, in his love for God, his love for his work, his love for his word, and. Uh, 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 and that is why we see that uh, Paul, you know, leaves him at this very uh, strategic uh, place uh, in Ephesus, um, which not only just had uh, the house churches there at Ephesus, but also was kind of a, a spiritual headquarters for the other churches uh, in that region, the seven churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, uh, Titeria, uh, Philadelphia, uh, uh, Laodicea, and um, uh, Sardis. So that was um, uh, uh, just going back to uh, you know a, a brief background of what we had studied um, uh, last Monday, and then we began um, studying uh, First Timothy chapter one. We read through First Timothy chapter one. Uh, we came right up to verse three. Um, so Paul says. Um, in verse three, you know, he's just encouraging Timothy to uh, remain in Ephesus, uh, that you may charge some that they may teach no other uh, doctrine. And so he, uh, this this whole chapter one, uh, he's basically giving him uh, uh, reasons why he wants uh, Timothy to uh, remain in uh, Ephesus. Uh, the reasons he's saying is because in verses three to seven, he says because they need the truth of the false doctrines that were preached verses 8 to 11 uh, he says i know you minister in a hard place uh, 12 to 16 uh, how god uses unworthy people uh, so uh, timothy must be feeling very unworthy and paul is talking about uh, how unworthy and, uh, and the worst sinner that he was and you know christ jesus saved him uh, and he was a chief of sinners but christ jesus saved him and there's no one uh, unworthy like Paul and so he says you know um, when God can use me he can even uh, use you and verses 17 he says because uh, you know uh, he's reminding uh, Timothy of uh, who he's serving he's serving a great God and verses 8 he's talking about uh, 18 he's talking about uh, you know uh, in the battlefield uh, you know a, a soldier does not uh, surrender uh, is just reminding him uh, of uh, you know a soldier who, uh, who who surrenders is a coward and basically soldiers are trained they never surrender to the enemy they fight uh, till their last breath and then uh, in verse 19 to 20 he says um, uh, because not everyone else uh, does so so he's saying that uh, in in verse 3 he says you know that you may charge some uh, says, says remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they may teach no other doctrine. So uh, the ancient Greek uh, word uh, for charge basically has uh, a military connotation. It's a military word, this word charge in the ancient Greek. Uh, it means to give strict orders uh, and the strict orders is coming from a commanding officer. So commanding officers giving strict uh, orders. And so Paul is telling um, young Timothy that, you know, uh, uh, he's just supposed to give that order. So when he gives that orders, you know, uh, there is no option that is presented, you know. Um, so Timothy wasn't to present uh, the option of correct doctrine to these some in, uh, you know, uh, Ephesus. Uh, he was to command them like a military officer saying that this is a correct uh, doctrine, not just give them the option to choose, but saying this is the correct doctrine and they have to uh, follow it. So there were some people, uh, you know, who were teaching uh, uh, these false uh, doctrines. And uh, and verse 4, he says, uh, uh, you know, what are these false doctrines? Uh, so what do we know about it? Uh, we gather some information from uh, verse 4 where it says, Now give heed to fables and endless genealogies uh, which causes disputes rather than godly edification 
which is in faith. So uh, these uh, false doctrines or the other doctrines, which is basically talking about is uh, Jewish fables and, uh, you know, endless Jewish uh, genealogies. I had mentioned about this when we studied the book of Romans. So it was not just something very, uh, this problem was not just a challenge, was not specific only to the churches at Ephesus, but was something that was um, prevalent uh, uh, throughout, uh, you know, uh, Europe and Asia Minor and, uh, you know, all the places that uh, Paul ministered to. Uh, basically, uh, it was because uh, Jews were turning uh, uh, were accepting Christ, they were becoming uh, Christians and joining the church and they were bringing in all of these Jewish legalistic rituals of circumcision, uh, keeping the food. We looked at it in, uh, studied it in Romans chapter, uh, in, in the book of Romans. Uh, we also see that, uh, you know, they, they brought about these Jewish fables, which are not, it's not part of the, uh, the Bible, but there was a lot of, um, uh, 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 ancient uh, Jewish, uh, uh, you know, uh, writings that they had discovered, which talks about uh, fables and endless uh, genealogies. But the other doctrine, uh, which was very prevalent at that time, was Gnosticism. Uh, and uh, Gnosticism was uh, something that was impacting the Christian mindset, the Christian world, the Christian church uh, during Paul's time. It was a prominent uh, heretical movement uh, during the second century uh, in the Christian church. Uh, so basically, I like to give you a, a little background about Gnosticism because it's something that, uh, you know, was um, a prevalent teaching uh, that was uh, that had spread and was uh, in the churches, disturbing the minds of uh, the people in the churches. So it's good to know about it just for your, uh, uh, you know, for your information. The term Gnosticism is derived from the Greek word, which means uh, the Greek word Gnosis, which means to know or knowledge. Uh, so it was um, a second century uh, religious movement. Um, and uh, the people who brought about this, um, this teaching uh, said that salvation could be uh, gained through a special form of secret knowledge. So you can just receive salvation uh, through secret knowledge and the secret knowledge will be revealed uh, to those who are, uh, you know, spiritual enough uh, in their mindsets to understand uh, the spiritual knowledge and only those who uh, receive this uh, impartation of the spiritual knowledge, they would uh, receive um, salvation. So basically Gnosticists uh, believe that the world was divided into the physical and the spiritual realms. Um, so. Uh, you know, a matter, you know, the physical world created of matter is evil and therefore it's in opposition uh, uh, to the spirit world and uh, uh, they believe that only the spirit is good and everything in this world is uh, evil. Uh, for the Gnostics, they believe that uh, uh, God is incomprehensible, he is unknowable, uh, and this, you know, of course, this conflict, uh, 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 you know, uh, it's an idea that conflicts our Christian understanding or a Christian uh, understanding or a concept of God who is personal, a personal God who desires a relationship or fellowship with human beings. Uh, uh, but uh, the Gnostics believe that God is incomprehensible and unknowable. Uh, Gnostics also, you know, um, uh, believe that there is an inferior God and a su superior God. So they have this distinction between an inferior God and a superior God. Uh, they they don't believe that uh, God created uh, the world because they're saying that the world is, of course, or the, the physical realm is evil. So God cannot create evil. So they divide again, uh, you know, they separate and they say there's an inferior God who created uh, this world and there is a superior God uh, who brought about redemption and uh, uh, salvation and for salvation for uh, Gnostics uh, you know they divide Christians into two categories they say one group is carnal uh, which is uh, and they believe they are inferior and the others are uh, and the other group is uh, spiritual or superior and they say only the superior uh, 
uh, Christians, you know, are uh, divinely enlightened persons uh, and they can comprehend these secret teachings and they can obtain uh, true salvation. So what is these secret teachings? We really don't know. Uh, uh, you know, it's something that they believe that will be revealed uh, uh, to them by this superior uh, God. But we believe that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Bible teaches us that salvation is available for everyone. It's not just for a few, but uh, salvation is uh, from grace to faith in Jesus Christ. We read about this in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and, uh, and 9. And it's not uh, through works but it is to, uh, uh, it's by grace through uh, faith, okay? And about Jesus Christ, Gnosis, uh, you know, when divided on their beliefs about Jesus Christ, uh, one view, uh, you know, held that, uh, you know, Jesus only appeared to have a human form, uh, but that he was actually a, a spirit being, only but he appeared to have a human form and uh, the other view of Gnostics who believe that uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, the divine spirit came upon Jesus's human body at baptism and departed before his uh, crucifixion uh, but we uh, believe or the Bible teaches us, uh, the Bible uh, tells us that, you know, Jesus was fully God and fully man, uh, that he was both human, he had both human and divine nature that were present in him. Uh, and hence he was able to provide uh, a suitable sacrifice for, uh, you know, the sins of the entire world. So just as a basic background of Gnosticism, you don't have to, you know, um, uh, yeah. it's it's not something that you need to keep in mind, but just, you know, in case uh, uh, you're studying scripture deeply and uh, you need to know what Gnosticism is, what they believed in, uh, and what context uh, the writers of the New Testament are writing, especially Paul, when he's writing to these churches, it's because of this, um, uh, this um, heretical movement that was very prevalent uh, in the Christian church uh, during uh, Paul's time in the second uh, century. Now, the endless genealogies, uh, which he's talking, he's mentioning here in verse 4, uh, is connected with, uh, you know, uh, one can be Jewish type of legalism, uh, uh, you know, again, about uh, circumcision, that those who were Greeks and Gentiles and they come to the faith, the Jews were imposing upon them uh, that, you know, they have to be circumcised, they have to eat certain kind of food, uh, observance of certain days. So they were bringing in all these Jewish legalism, which is kind of uh, overburdening uh, uh, the people in the church. And so it does again come into a place where uh, salvation is not by grace to faith, but by works which these uh, uh, Jewish believers uh, were bringing into the church. And also this Jewish type of legalism, uh, uh, which they were teaching was that you can receive righteousness uh, by virtue of one's ancestry. So they were saying that, you know, the Jews, they had the upper hand because uh, they were from the generation or the race of um, uh, of Abraham. And so we see how beautifully uh, uh, Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he talks about uh, how uh, uh, Abraham receives righteousness, not, uh, you know, he received righteousness not just because of the, the covenant uh, that God made with him and the sign of that covenant, the circumcision, but before that he was declared righteous, but it's because of his uh, faith and how Beautifully, Paul talks about, uh, you know, how uh, we can be made uh, righteous in Christ Jesus. It's through our faith and how we can be uh, uh, interlinked into that. It's because of what Jesus did on the uh, cross for us. And then uh, we also see that, you know, when Paul was writing about these doctrines, he had in mind, uh, you know, these mystic readings of uh, Old Testament uh, genealogies. Now, ancient uh, Jewish writings had discovered, uh, uh, you know, uh, most complex genealogies, uh, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, just complex uh, uh, genealogies uh, connecting you know them with spiritual mysteries wild speculations with uh, about spiritual mysteries so uh, and people the jewish uh, people uh, were consumed and were very interested in all of these things uh, but paul is saying you know these other doctrines 
uh, these um, uh, endless genealogies, these fables, what is the end result? He's telling Timothy that his end result is it's not going to bring godly uh, edification, but it's just going to bring dispute and um, uh, strife. Okay. Um, so we see that when, uh, you know, how do we know what is uh, uh, the many doctrines that are coming up today? Uh, uh, the main thing is to just stand behind and watch, because if it is sound teaching uh, from the word of God, the right doctrine, then it's going to bring about godly uh, edification in the faith. It's going to build up people in the faith. Uh, but if it's uh, not uh, something that is from God, it's not uh, from the word of God, then it's something that's going to bring about strife and uh, uh, division. So one way uh, to know whether what we are listening to or hearing from uh, a speaker or from, a, uh, you know, some new theology that's come up is just wait to see, you know, uh, what is the end result? Because uh, Jesus says you'll be known by your fruits. Your works will be known by uh, the fruits will make known your uh, works. So what is the fruit of uh, these um, uh, wrong doctrines that people are teaching? The end result is going to be just strife and uh, division but if it is uh, uh, the right doctrine, it's going to build up people in the faith. People are going to be strengthened in their faith. It's going to bring about uh, godly uh, ed edification. Uh, we also see that it was not something that uh, Paul is just mentioning to Timothy. Now it has been a problem in the church of Ephesus long before um, even uh, you know, before Timothy took on charge of overseeing, uh, or spiritually overseeing the churches at Ephesus, uh, you know, uh, 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 during the end of his third missionary journey, uh, Paul also um, you know meets the uh, uh, elders. Uh, you know, nine years before he writes First Timothy, he meets these uh, uh, elders. Uh, and he also, you know, speaks to them. We looked at it in the back, uh, when we did the background or the study, uh, the introduction to First Timothy. Uh, we also see that Paul had warned these elders or these leaders at the church in Ephesus uh, about these false teachings. And uh, we get a glimpse of this in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 32. So can one of you please read Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 32, please? Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 32. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Amen. Thank you, Divya. So here, Paul is already warning them. Uh, uh, he's writing, uh, he's telling the leaders here at Ephesus nine years before he's even writing to first, uh, writing to Timothy in his letter, uh, uh, First Timothy. Uh, we also see that when Paul uh, writes his epistle of uh, Ep Ephesians, you know, to the church at Ephesus when he was imprisoned in Rome, uh, he wants uh, the uh, the believers to be built up. And he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that you should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So we see that, you know, this is an ongoing problem. And Paul has been uh, talking to them, writing to them, uh, warning the leaders. But, uh, you know, uh, there it still continues in the church. And Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him what he needs to uh, do. So what? why is Paul, uh, you know, uh, stressing on this whole thing of doctrine? Uh, because, you know, doctrine is very important to God. Um, and it should also be important uh, 
to us as his people. We need to guard the truths uh, that has been revealed to us in God's word. And to guard the truth, one of the ways we can do it is, um, you know, we need to study God's word. Uh, we need to learn God's word. So even as you are... Uh, you know, learning so many courses, learning so many things from the Word of God, uh, learning all of these, um, uh, the books that uh, are there in the Old Testament, New Testament. You know, it's important for you to take time to study it, uh, to know the doctrines. We studied about the doctrines in systematic theology as well, uh, uh, the doctrine of uh, Jesus Christ uh, in Christology. Uh, important to to be grounded uh, in the truths of all the doctrines so that, you know, you can teach and impart the right doctrines to the people, uh, you know, who God is going to make you overseers or you're going to be shepherds of the flock that God is entrusting you to or, uh, you know, teaching it to your children or uh, teaching it um, the Bible study group or uh, the cell group or life group, whatever you are uh, part of. So today, you know, in today's world, uh, what one believes, that is, you know, the, uh, the doctrines that people uh, believe is uh, unimportant for most people. You know, uh, in the spirit of the modern age that we are living in, uh, uh, you know, has so much influenced uh, or heavily influenced, uh, you know, the Christian doctrines or the Christian mindset or what people uh, believe in, you know. And we live in a day when uh, Pilate's question that Pilate asked uh, in John chapter 18, verse 38, what is truth? You know, and uh, the same question, if it's asked today, you know, uh, people answer it as, you know, whatever it means to you. So what, whatever you understand, whatever you want to think, whatever you believe in, that is the truth, you know. So, um, but that is deviating from or misleading or, uh, you know, is, is, is Satan's way of deception of leading us uh, from the truth in God's uh, word. So, uh, you know, we see that, yes, truth is important to God and also should be important uh, to his um, people. And that is what we see at the high priestly prayer with when Jesus prayed. You know, uh, Father, let them know the truth and let the truth set them uh, free. Okay. Any questions so far from verses 1 to verse uh, 4? If not, we'll move on to verses 5 to seven. Anyone has any questions from verses one to four? Okay, there are no questions. Can one of you please read verses five to seven, please? First Timothy chapter one, verses five to seven. Verses five to seven. Now the purchase, so now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Thank you, Christopher. So um, Paul is saying that the purpose of the commandment or the purpose of the law is found in its inward work upon the heart of a, a person. It's not just mere outward observance because the law had become uh, just a mere outward observance. And that's why God is saying, you know, I will remove uh, in the Old Testament, I will remove your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon your heart and, my, and your mind and my spirit uh, will help you to keep uh, my laws and my uh, commands. So, you know, it had just become something that was very outward for them. It was not something that was an inward, uh, you know, out of an inward love for God that they were keeping the laws, the commandments, they were making those sacrifices, they were observing those special days. Um, but, you know, the whole purpose of the law that was given to them, it just became an outward work, uh, uh, you know, and not an inward um, uh, work that God meant it uh, to be. So without this understanding, you know, it was easy uh, for uh, the people, uh, the Jewish people to get into, uh, 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 to become very legalistic and, and keeping uh, the laws. And we read about that. And even Jesus uh, talks about this when he encounters these Jews in, in the Gospels. Uh, 
uh, and it it become to an extent where it just became an outward performance and appearance and that's why jesus says that you know they are like these whitewashed tombs that look very beautiful on the outside you know they were wearing um, uh, uh, you know these uh, they they had their uh, um, the, the word written on their forehead, bound on their forehead, on their tassels, uh, you know, on their clothes and everything. And they went about judging people, um, you know, praying loudly in the synagogues in the and in the street and all of those things. It was just an out, mere outward uh, appearance, but was not something that they did out of a love for God uh, or, um, you know, out of worship or reverence. Um, to God. But here, you know, uh, Paul is saying, what does God want from us? So the purpose of the commandment, basically, he's um, saying, or the purpose of the law is, first of all, love, you know, love from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. So uh, Paul is talking about why God basically gave the command uh, commandments and the laws and he knows that even as this uh, uh, he's writing this letter it's not just going to be read by timothy but also be going to be read aloud to the churches at ephesus and the uh, surrounding areas so he's saying the purpose of the commandment is love and uh, uh you know uh, and he says that you know uh, keep focused on these three things loving uh, out of a pure heart good conscience and sincere faith do not stray away from this do not deviate from this core truth uh, into other unnecessary uh, things so pure heart is basically you know being pure in uh, your motives uh, having no selfish interest no personal uh, agendas um, no love from a pure heart uh, suggests the idea that uh, the problem in Ephesus, uh, you know, which was along uh, these uh, Jewish type of legalistic lines, uh, where these Jews basically misunderstood the commandments and the laws, and they were bringing it in, and they would just basically love and accept people who would follow these uh, strict rituals and laws that the, the Jews, um, you know, want to be uh, brought into the church. Uh, but he's saying, you know. Uh, this is not love. This is not what uh, 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 the commandment of love that God has given to us. Uh, it's not about uh, legalism. It's not about keeping certain rituals, but it's just loving people, uh, uh, you know, out of pure motives, no selfish um, interests or personal agendas and a good conscience or a clear conscience. Uh, you know, it's good conscience, a clear conscience where, uh, you know, uh, one is living right before both God and uh, man. And then sincere faith, uh, he's talking about real faith. And uh, he's not talking about a faith that is a pretense that you put in front of people uh, so that people will think, uh, oh, how spiritual they are, uh, you know, how much they love the law, how much they love God. Uh, but it's not putting on a, uh, a pretense before people, but it's just real, genuine um, faith. So, you know, how does this apply to us? You know, when we spend time in God's word, uh, you know, uh, if it does not produce love from a pure heart, if it's not producing a good conscience and sincere faith, then there is something uh, wrong. Uh, it, it, there can be a problem where we, be, uh, you know, we are becoming very legalistic. And there are many churches uh, where legalism, uh, you know, is so... Uh, overpowering is so overburdening people uh you know and um, legalism kind of twists god's word what he has said so instead of showing love people become very harsh and judgmental if you don't dress up in a certain way you don't uh, worship in a certain way you don't do things in a certain way uh you know uh, people can become very harsh and judgmental uh, we see this very prevalent in our churches uh you know instead of having a good conscience uh, people feel condemned uh you know thinking that they don't measure up uh, because they uh, they are not able to keep up with the the the, the legalistic rituals or the legalism that the church is bringing about uh, and also they begin to feel very condemned uh, in the sight of God that you know um, they doubt their own salvation they doubt whether God loves them uh, and it's easy for people um, 
to see that they really don't fit in church or they're not able to do things and because they're not able to keep uh, the church so-called church commandments or laws uh, and they be basically breaking it and people are becoming very judgmental of them it's better to leave the church and so they have nothing to do with the church they don't uh, have the fellowship um, and then they stray away from god and these this kind of legalism you know is a subtle way that satan just you know enters our churches and brings about uh, strife and um, division and also a lot of lies so we're so bound by uh, these things and we look at um, people in from other faith you know who do not know uh, christ who do not know jesus who are so bound by rituals or so bound by days and customs and um, things that they have to do and uh, living in so much of fear that if they don't do it you know uh, uh, they will incur curses or uh, the judgment of um, uh, god so basically all boil, boils down to works and not grace uh, which uh, satan you know easily uh, leads people astray and then he's uh, you know instead of sincere faith uh, you know practically we trust in our own ability to please god so people come to a place where they're saying hey, I'm keeping all of these uh, rules and rituals that the, law, the church wants me to understand uh, and hence I'm pleasing to God. But those who are not able to keep it, you know, uh, they feel condemned, they feel that they are not, uh, you know, worthy in God's sight, they become unworthy people and they're not able to do things uh, uh, and hence it becomes uh, no longer a uh, salvation by grace uh, uh, through faith but by works which which we see in uh, many churches today so you know uh, uh, it's important that you know even as we study god's word even as you're studying these doctrines you know it produces in our, us a love from a pure heart a good conscience and a sincere faith so as believers let's stay with this a pure heart a good or clear conscience good or clear conscience and sincere faith verse six um paul writes from which some have strayed and have turned aside to yes christopher you can go ahead you can unmute your mic and uh yes pastor i just wanted to find out with regards to understand this a little more clearly uh when you make when it mentions about the purpose of the commandment uh is it referring to uh, also the 12 the, the 10 commandments and uh, uh you know how people should should live their lives based on those on those 10 uh, 10 commandments and the second question is with regards to if you could give us a few examples uh in the current times where people have uh, or where there's there's a lot of legality um, being uh, uh you know proclaimed and uh, therefore people are you know uh, are not really uh, uh, are, they, are, they are actually getting they are actually been having they are straight and they are you know they are, as, as you mentioned you know, turn aside your idle talk so if you could give us a, give us a few examples for that please yes thank you christopher so your first question is uh, you know in, in with regard to uh, the commandments, the purpose of the commandment is not just the Ten Commandments, but there are also 613 uh, uh, more commandments or laws that God had given to them. Uh, 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 basically, in every area that uh, we read in, um, you know, in the book of uh, uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, where the laws are all mentioned, also about, uh, you know, uh, about the covenant, uh, the laws about keeping the covenant, uh, of God. So uh, it's talking about the whole purpose of the law, looking at it as one. Because, you know, Paul says if you, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep one law and break the others, it's as good as, you know, you've broken everything. So we see uh, the law as just one whole entity. But when we keep one, uh, you know, we also required to keep the others or it requires us to keep the others as well not just keep some uh, which uh, uh, is easy for us comfortable for us and break the others does that help christopher no sorry so sorry you so you're saying that the the 
the purpose of the commandments will be the, the Ten Commandments and also the 630. Um, yes, we're looking at the law as a, as a whole. Okay, but I thought that if we if we just live by the law, then we are not, uh, you know, uh, as mentioned over here, right? Um, uh, people who have who have who live by the law are not uh, may 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 be ones who are, you know, uh, not really, uh, uh, you know, practicing it, or you know, they're not. Uh, so I just wanted to understand the distinction between what, uh, you know. The commandment and the law. What, where, where, you know, what is the distinction in, between the two? Yeah, the law has uh, the commandments as well. Commandment is also the law. Yes. Uh, so here, Paul is not saying that you know uh, he's uh, as he's written in Romans. We studied. It's not the law, uh, but and here you know they're bringing in all of these laws and they're saying you have to follow all of these laws. Uh, that's how you receive. Uh, you keep your salvation going so he's saying it's not about uh, it's not about these legalistic rituals that you you know observe it's uh, 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 it's by grace through faith that you receive but you know the jews even though they have received salvation they come to the church they they have they're bringing in these uh, jewish legalism and that is what is causing a lot of strife and dispute and disorder in the church which he mentions in verses 3 and 4 Does that help, uh, Christopher? So basically, some um, the ones that are man-made are the, the ones that actually come from God. Is that is that kind of the distinction? So the ones that are man-made, man-made, uh, mm -hmm. and the ones that really come from God, as in as in you know in the Bible or you know. That's... Oh, you mean the circumcision and the rituals of keeping food and all of those things? No, so, so I'm just trying to I'm, okay. I'm I'm just trying to understand. Um, if, if if we follow the law, um, is is that is that the right way to do it? Even if it is man-made, I mean, made by uh, uh, you know, uh, created by man, or do we for, do we need to follow? Do we follow what is there in the Bible? Okay, so uh, this circumcision ritual is yes, is there in the Bible? The food, uh, the way you dress, the way you do things is all uh, what uh, the law God had given the people. But then uh, Paul is bringing them to an understanding of that the law was just something that you know uh, showed them. Uh, he talks about it in 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 the in the, in the verses below uh, in chapter one. You know the law is it was not for the righteous but for the sinners because it basically the, what did the law do? The law's basic work was it made a, a sinner know that they have sinned against God. Um, and keeping the law is not going to bring about making you righteous. That means it's not going to give you a right standing uh, with God. But, you know, um, it's it's by grace and what Jesus has done and through faith in Christ Jesus that gives you a right standing. But the whole purpose of the law was it revealed uh, sin. It, it showed a person that they have uh, broken uh, the commandments of God. They have not kept the law. Uh, how do people know that they have... Uh, you know, not uh, kept the law of God. It's a law that uh, showed them. It was a law that revealed to them that they are sinners, that they, they need grace, they need forgiveness, and they need salvation. So uh, you're talking about whether it's uh, keeping uh, godly laws or it's about keeping man-made laws. Even now, even though we live by grace, yes, we still, uh, you know, the commandments, the laws are still applicable because the law is not something that is bounding or binding on us it's not something that is 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 going to uh, kind of uh, burden us but the, uh, that was not god's main uh, intent or purpose for giving the law the law is something that helps us uh, uh, to enjoy uh, life in god to to know what god wants us to do to uh, to live lives that are um, pleasing and holy and acceptable and to receive uh, the fullness of life. So some of the laws even had to do with, uh, you know, uh, what kind of food to eat, what kind of uh, uh, clothes to wear. So, you know, people who study the Old Testament laws, they say, you know, 
in those days god gave these uh, these uh, you know food the laws for food dietary things it is so good it's so healthy and so applicable for uh, people uh, in our today's world you know, to go back to those uh, kind of um, uh, uh, eating habits or the kind of food that we need to eat so the law that god gave us is not something that we need to keep it as something that you know is uh, uh, out of a ritual or uh, something that is binding us, something that is trading us, something that's overpowering us, but it's something that is going to just enable us to understand the heart of God, what he has for us. Uh, and uh, the other purpose of the law is also why God gave the Israelites. Is so when they live by this law, you know, every nation around them had laws. The Israelites did not. So the purpose God gave them all of these laws, you know, uh, if you look at so many laws, Laws that God gave them is so that through these laws, people will know the Lord their God that they worship. So that was another uh, 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 the reason why God gave them the law was for them to enjoy who God is, what He's doing in their midst, um, to to live that uh, fullness of life, uh, the meaningful life that is in in God, and also for other people to come and know this God has given them this law. So through this law, they would know and encounter God himself. And uh, the, the man-made uh, laws that they uh, they made of all these Jewish fables and genealogies, uh, yes, was binding on people. And Paul was saying, you know, this is causing strife and division. And this is not what is important. And that's why he's bringing back bringing them back to the core of why the uh, the commandments or the laws that God has given them is for love. Uh, a good conscience to know what is right and wrong and for faith in God. Did that help, Christopher? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, some examples that you had asked for uh, some of uh, the legalistic rituals that people, uh, you know, uh, uh, have in churches today. Uh, some of them, you know, is uh, one of them is if you, uh, you know, if you receive salvation, then you can't be baptized. You have to be part of the church for uh, three months or six months, and you'll have to be, uh, you know, join the uh, the fasting prayer. You have to come through every services, and after that, you know, based on uh, you know uh, their involvement in the church and their how regular they are, the attendance, then the pastor will think, okay. Uh, this person is eligible for uh, baptism. But that's not what the word of God says. You know, uh, uh, when you receive Christ, you know, you're baptized. You know, you can receive a uh, baptism. And uh, in some churches, uh, you know, uh, only after you uh, have received salvation, after you are baptized, after you are growing in the word, uh, ministering, uh, then you can be prayed for Holy Spirit baptism. Then you can receive uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can start speaking in tongues. Uh, if you're a new believer, you cannot, which is not true because, uh, you know, some people uh, have, uh, we see that in, in, in Acts, you know, at the Cornelius place when uh, Paul goes to uh, Cornelius's house and Paul is just preaching the gospel. Uh, he's not even yet give, come to the place where he's giving them the altar call. And uh, these people are cut in their heart, which means they uh, realize that they have sinned against God. And, um, you know, um, and they start speaking in tongues. And Paul and the other Jews who had come along with Paul, they are surprised because they thought it's only for them, you know, but it's also for the Gentiles. And no one prayed over them. They were not even baptized in the water. No one even gave them the salvation uh, altar call, so to say. But they received Christ and they were not even water baptized, but they received uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So uh, God was showing, the Holy Spirit was also showing Paul uh, how he's working, you know. So uh, this can become like a, a legalistic thing. You have to do all of these things, then only you can... Um, you know, receive uh, uh, baptism, you can receive the gifts of the Spirit, uh, uh, you can receive Holy Communion, uh, you have to be of a certain age, you have to do certain things, uh, then you can receive uh, Holy Communion. But, you know, Holy Communion is something that you can give people who've accepted Jesus Christ so that they can just uh, uh, receive uh, the full benefits of what Jesus has done uh, on the cross for them. Why make them wait 
for them to just participate and receive uh, and be blessed with what Jesus has already uh, done on the cross. And also in the area of, uh, uh, you know, certain kinds of dressing, you know, in certain churches, you're not allowed to wear jewelry, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, you are, um, and a certain kind of people can teach and preach and, uh, uh, you know, but if you have that gift of teaching and preaching, you can't, you have to wait, you have to, you know, go through certain uh, uh, classes and all of that uh, before you teach and preach. Uh, even if you've come from a Bible study, uh, for, uh, from a Bible college. Um, so all of these are kind of, you know, uh, the dressing where you sit down, uh, you know, all of those can be binding on people and uh, uh, people can, can get very offended sometimes because they are judged if they are not dressed in a certain way, they're not doing things in a certain way. Uh, if, uh, you know, they have, uh, uh, they're worshipping in a certain church, but they're giving uh, their, you know, they're, they're also part of missions uh, with another mission organization, contributing there, supporting there, uh, then, you know, they're judged, they are uh, questioned, uh, but we have no uh, rights on what pe where people go and minister, where they go for Bible studies, uh, where they, um, you know, uh, give their tithes and offerings. But yet they need to be faithful to the local church. And if they're doing that, then you know we just can't control people if uh, uh, they, they they want to be part of other ministries where they're learning and just being built up and edified in the faith. Uh, more of you can add uh, to Christopher, uh, you know, if you have seen some legalistic uh, rituals and uh, rules that are binding on people in your churches, we can come back after the break and uh, uh, some of you can share that. Is that okay, Christopher? Okay, okay we'll um, go for our break now and we'll come back after the break and continue. Thank you.